Okay, here is chapter nine. We're gonna only cover uh, sections one and two. So basically how things are grown. And this is really cool. And um, you know, it's it, basically you have different media to grow different things depending on what you are supposed to be growing. So we like to talk a lot about microfilms um, in this class because they're very common and they can be very detrimental. And so some of these are like um, medical devices that are inserted into a patient's body can become contaminated within biofilm um, micro microorganisms that become enmeshed or grown into the sticky material that they secrete. Um, so this is a picture on the left from an electron microscopy that shows the inside walls of an indwelling catheter. So this happens in catheters, shunts, um, you know, leads for wires for pacemaker defibrillators, um, any type of an implant, um, corneal implants, anything has the possibility of, of growing these. And so this is why things have to be very sterile and aseptic when uh, during surgery. And obviously the thing needs to be sterilized before it gets put into the body or else we have lots of problems. All right. And then um, these arrows are pointing to the round cells of Staph aureus bacteria that um, attach the layers of the extracellular substrate. And then over here on the garbage can, smells like a great summer day in the swamp, right? So the garbage can served as a rain collector. Uh, the arrow points to the green biofilm that was grown on the sides of the container. I have horses, guys. So, I mean, this happens in horse troughs, cattle troughs, sheep trough, anything, water, dog bowls, you know, things leave it out in the hot sun and things grow, right? So biofilms are natural. Um, just we try to take care of them because if they um, go too long, they can obviously cause lots of problems. Um, so a uh, little bit about how cells uh, replicate and divide. The electron micrograph on the left depicts two cells of Salmonella tryptomerum after binary fission. So binary, bi means two. Fission is um, things that are starting to fuse or, or separate, right? And so binary fission, in this case, it separates. So binary fission in bacteria starts with the replication of the DNA as the cell gets longer. And then the division septum or divide, divide, divider division, right, is going to form in the center of the cell. And then the two daughter cells are going to branch off and they're going to be in sizzle, similar size and form. And they're going to separate and they each receive a copy of the original chromosome. So again, as you can see, we have our original cell. It starts to duplicate inside. And then when the um, DNA information is done duplicating, then the cell um, kind of pinches off into two uh identical daughter cells so um fits z proteins uh are going to assemble to form a z ring that you can see here in the dotted line and this z ring is anchored to the plasma membrane and the z ring pinches the cell envelope um to separate the cytoplasm of new cells and so basically as you can see here it, it's kind of like um you know if you guys have ever kneaded bread or made bread you can pinch it off or you can use a rubber band to put things in the middle and it causes two things to separate right so this is what that fits the z ring and that z ring is going to do it basically grows in the middle and it's going to separate off the two cells <clears throat> um so that that septum or that divider can like grow in there and actually pick off and plunk and make two separate cells um so basically uh what this is showing is things double so things are going to be in pretty much an even number right so if you start with one cell in generation zero when one doubles, it's gonna become two cells at the end of generation one. And then at the end of generation two, those two cells are gonna double and become four. Four will double, become eight. Eight doubles and become 16. So you can see that things grow very um, rapidly, right? And so uh, each division divides the cell into two. And so that's is why it's um, two different cells. So the parental cell is gonna divide and it gives rise to two daughter cells. And each of the daughter cells in turn divides, giving a total of four cells in the second generation and therefore eight cells in the third generation, 16, 32, 64, et cetera. They aren't gonna really ever ask you more than like three or four generations probably. So don't worry about, um, Oh, about how many things but if you really if your brain's really smart mine's not it's two to the nth power and being the cycle number right okay um so growth curve of bacterial cultures is represented by this logarithmic number like we just talked about things double in nature and so it's going to be very 
logarithmic and it just takes off and grows. And then the graph can divide, be divided into four different phases according to how sharp the curve is. And so first off, we have the lag phase, which is basically the cells are getting, like ramping up to like get the nutrients that they need to be able to duplicate. So there's no increase in the living number of uh, bacterial cells, but they're kind of like, hey guys, let's get ready to duplicate. And then the log phase here is where we have the exponential increase in the number of living cells. So that's when it doubles with each. So like if we start with two, it ends with four, four to eight, eight to 16, et cetera. And then after a while, you know, cells are grown in a small area, right? So after a while, we're going to like tap out and not be able to, um, you know, grow anymore because we're out of nutrients, et cetera. So this is where that stationary phase is where the plat there is a plateau or a leveling of the number of living bacteria cells that are being made. And so this is where the rate of cell division and cell death is roughly the same. And then after that, when we're completely out of nutrients, et cetera, okay, um, then you're going to have cellular death or a decline phase. And this is when you have an exponential decrease in the number of living bacterial cells. Um, so these graphs are both going to illustrate the population growth during the log phase of bacterial sample with an initial population of one cell in the doubling time of one hour. But over here in A, when plotted on, on, a, on uh, a rhythmic metric scale, the growth rate is going to resemble a curve, but when it is um, plotted on a semi-logarithmic scale, sorry, my brain is like having an issue at the moment. Um, this means that the values on the y-axis here are logarithmic, then the growth appears to be linear. So you can see that cells per milliliter, this one's um, just, uh, you know, different. It's a, de a definitive number where this is cells per milliliter in, um, you know, a logarithmic scale, then you can see that it's, it's the same data. It's just shown a little bit differently. Um, a chemostat, this is a culture vesicle that is fitted with an opening to add nutrients here, which would be basically feeding the cells and then an outlet to remove the um, toxic waste and dead cells over on the right hand side. And so basically, since we're feeding and removing, it's going to be able to keep cells growing at a constant state. And so the addition and the removal of fluids is adjusted to maintain the culture in that logarithmic super high growth um, span, where if it's aerobic without oxygen uh, bacteria that are being grown, then the suitable oxygen levels are going to be maintained as well as feeding and getting rid of any of the dead um, microbes. Um, basically, how do we count slides and keep track of growth and how fast things are? We can use growth chambers, right? And so this is a petrol hauser chamber, and it's a special slide that's designed for counting bacterial cells in the measured volume of a sample. So for instance, you'd put 10 microliters in there, and then um, you would count how many cells you have that time, like divide, um, that by say okay i have a milliliter 10 microliters is one whatever of it and then times what you count by the total volume and you get your total number of cells um you can also uh look at oh well, and that would give you the total number of cells period this is what it would look like if you're looking at it underneath the cell you'd count how many cells you see in that cross section and then again you would um, multiply it by known facts you have a known volume of what is being um, grown in your test tube and in the sample that you aliquoted etc so this is how i used to count cells using a, a chamber a chamber slide um, you can also do fluorescent staining, um, and uh, this can be used to differentiate between viable and dead bacteria cells um, for counting. And so in this example, the viable or the, or the alive cells are stained green, whereas the dead cells are stained red. What did I used to use? Um, methylene blue, bromophenol blue. It was a blue dye of some sort. I, I can't remember. If I remember, I'll tell you guys in lecture. But it was really cool because basically if the cells were alive, it could keep the blue dye out of the inner part of the cell, where if the cells were dead, then that membrane was no longer, um, you know, maintainable. And so it would allow the dye to permeate or go inside. Now it's going to drive me. I might have to pause this video. I'm going to pause this video. Hold on a second. That didn't pause at all. I'll try fan blue.
Thank you, Dr. Google. So um, it's the most commonly used dye in research labs to uh, assess cell viability. Trifan blue is an impermeable dye that cannot pass intact cell membranes of living cells in contrast to dead cell membranes. Thank you. This was 20 years ago. Oh my God, I just aged myself a whole bunch. Anywho, um, Trifan blue. It was fun to do. I loved it. Okay. Okay, I didn't love my boss, so at that time I didn't love it, but I think it's cool to know how to do. All right, anyway, uh, another way that you can do this more automated is using a Coulter counter, and this is an electronic device that counts the cells, and it measures the change in the resistance um, of the electrolyte solution that takes place um, when the cell passes through a small opening inside the um, chamber, right? And then a detector automatically counts the number of cells that pass through the opening. Very fancy, a lot more expensive. I got to never use one of these, never got to use one of these because it was too expensive. And the amount of cell culturing that we did was minimal, but still very cool. Um, so basically, um, another thing that we do want to talk about is serial dilutions. I do believe that we do one of these in labs. Uh, so basically, a serial dilution involves diluting a fixed volume of cells mixed with a dilution solution. Um, using the previous dilution as the inoculum, or basically the supplier, right? And the result is going to be a dilution to the original culture by an exponentially uh, growth factor. So if we have one milliliter of original sample, and we um, put it into a test tube with nine milliliters of broth, then it's a one to 10 dilution. If we take a mix that and take a milliliter and do that, then we um, now have a one to 100 different uh, dilution dilute it farther, this is a serial dilution, right? So dilute it farther, it's one in 1,000, one to one, 10,000, one to 100,000. And you can see that basically it, it decreases the amount of cellular concentration so that we can actually count it and get a reliable result instead of just, oh, wow, it's really turbid or murky. Um, plate pouring methods. Um, I don't think we get to do any of this in um, lab, but it's pretty cool to be able to do. So basically you have a bacteria sample that's going to be mixed with the warm auger and um, then the sample is poured onto a sterile plate and then you use a hockey stick. It's literally called a hockey stick uh, or you can sample, you can swirl it around to mix it and allow it to solidify and then the plate is going to be incubated until the bacterial colonies um, grow. And so um, this is really cool because it can be re repeated for each serial dilution to get an accurate count of what's going on. Um, you can also do, oh, this is the hockey puck. This was the one that they just swirled it around, and this is the same type thing, a thing that I talked about, but you use the hockey puck to, um, to spread it out. And um, then this is the most probable number method, and this is a sets of um, five broth tubes are inoculated with three different volumes of pond water. And then the bacterial growth is assessed through the change in color of the broth from red to yellow as lactose is fermented. And we will be doing this in um, one of the labs because it's very cool that you get to be able to see it and um, the fermentation and the difference in pHs, et cetera, from using phenylalanine, et cetera, your phenol. You can also use a spectrophotometer to measure the turbidity or the cloudiness of the sample. Remember, the more cloudy, the more cells that we have, the less cloudy or the less turbid, then we have the, not as much cell growth, right? So if you look very closely, unless that smudges on my computer, you can see, um, you know, that there aren't very many things that are growing in this sample where, well, I guess that's a detector, so that doesn't make sense. But this one is clear, so there's not many things growing in that where this one is very turbid. So there are a lot of microbes that are growing in that. And the last slide would be looking at this. Um, this uh, shows the replicate, uh, replicate by fragmentation, so different types of um, replicating. So we talked about fusion, we talked about um, a couple different other ways, and then fragmentation is basically um, where something fragments off and then it starts and it regrows the whole thing. So here's another example where in this electron micrograph, the cells of gamma, um, I don't know, geoba, we'll call it, <laughs> our buddy, and the larger cells, the mother cell, where the um, one that's budding off is going to be the daughter cell. So the parts that are labeled are the nucleus and the nuclear envelope that's still forming. All right, so basically you duplicate your genetic information and it buds off and pinches off and goes and makes a new cell. All right, and so that is what we are going to be talking about for the rest of chapter nine. We'll see you all in class.